checks and wheat checks. The bite sized cereals in the red and white checkerboard packages present Space Patrol. <laughs> High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander in Chief of the Space Patrol. <laughs> In today's transcribed Space Patrol adventure, Buzz and Happy are in a surface car speeding down a highway toward Lowell City on the planet Mars. It looks like we're going to make it, Commander. If anyone was going to stop us, they've lost their... Commander, look. I see it, Hat. It's an atmosphere ship. It's swooping down right on top of us. The Cobra Gang. And there's no way we can fight them off. What they're waiting for. If that ship's on, they're close enough to blast us to pieces. Uh Uh-oh. What's that? It's a magnetic holding field. Smoke and rockets are picking up the car. They're going to help us. If they cut that field, we'll crash. We'll return in just a moment with today's exciting Space Patrol adventure, The Zero Ray. Rice checks are the perfect size. It's tops with all the guys. Fit right into a spoon, good to eat, morning, evening, and noon. Well, hi, Space Patrollers. This is Captain Dick Tufeld, and that was George, the Space Patrol jingle maker, telling you in his way that rice checks are tops for size. For flavor, tops, too. Those checks ring a bell. Any way you eat them, rice checks taste swell. Tops for taste, you bet. A delicious toasted taste. Rice checks will ring the bell with you, Space Patrollers, any way you eat it. With a good breakfast or out of the box for a snack, eat rice checks, gang, for a quick comeback. A quick comeback or a quick go-ahead. You get it after a nourishing breakfast with rice checks. Because rice checks are tops for get up and go. If you like whole wheat, super keen and neat, make sure, Space Patrollers, the checks you eat are wheat. Rice checks, wheat checks, in the red and white checkerboard package. With the picture of Commander Corey or Cadet Happy on the outside and the free Space Patrol trading card inside. Rice checks, wheat checks, tops three ways, for taste, for size, for get up and go. And now today's Space Patrol adventure, The Zero Ray. With Emil Gargoth at last in custody on Terra, Commander Corey has had every right to consider the menace of the Cobra Gang to be ended. Even if Gargoth should stubbornly refuse to name his henchmen, the Brainograph could easily reveal their identities and every detail of the elaborate structure of the criminal organization. But something has happened to prevent the immediate use of the Brainograph on Emil Gargoth. In the central office at Space Patrol headquarters, Commander Corey fumes at the delay. There isn't any excuse for this. I gave orders that Gargoth was to be watched every second. Well, maybe he really did get sick, Commander. Of course he's sick. Must have had some chemical concealed on him. Somebody slipped up when they searched him. Well, anyway, he'll be out of the hospital in a day or so, and then we can give him the brainograph test. Yeah, but then most of his important agents will know Gargoth has been captured. They'll have time to get away. I guess that's right. But at least they won't be operating as the Cobra Gang. There'll just be a lot of individual rats running for cover. Well, so much dependent on a fast closing in on Gargoth's leaders. I get that, will you, Ham? Yes, sir. Commander Corey's office. Get that happy here. Yes, Dr. Arnold. Yeah, he's right here. Commander, it sounds important. Yes, Dr. Arnold. What? But I posted a guard. I'll be right over. We've got to get over to the Terra Hospital right away. Gargoth has escaped. A few moments later, in the office of the superintendent of the Terra Hospital, Buzz and Happy listened to a greatly distressed Dr. Arnold. Before you question your guards, Commander, I want to accept full responsibility. Emil Gargoth was admitted here as a criminal and as hospital superintendent... Uh, just a minute, I... Dr. Arnold. The matter of responsibility for Gargoth's escape is secondary right now. I want to find out where he is and how he got away. I, uh... I'm sorry, I can't tell you that, Commander. There was so much confusion at the time, I... All right, Doctor. Happy. Yes, sir? Bring those two guards in here. I'll find out why they left their posts at the door of Gargoth's room. I can tell you that, Commander. Now, hold it, Hal. All right, Doctor. They left their posts to move some patients that were completely helpless. Patients that I thought were in grave danger. Danger from what? Fire, explosion, I don't know. Things were in a turmoil here for a while. What do you mean, fire and explosion? Well, everything went crazy all of a sudden. From all over the hospital, patients were complaining that, that their rooms were too warm. The heating system was out of control. And then we discovered the water pipes were frozen. Frozen? Here on Terra? That's right. It's as though the electronic brain that controls our temperature systems had gone mad. Patients, nurses, even some of the doctors were panic-stricken. You say the temperature controls went mad. What caused it? I don't know. But I didn't want helpless patients to be hurt in a fire or explosion or whatever was threatening. I gave an order to my staff to evacuate the bedridden patients, and your space patrol guards elected to help. During the confusion, Gargoth disappeared. I have jurisdiction over this hospital, Commander. I declared an emergency. Your guards acted accordingly. I hope you won't be too hard on them. Technically, they deserted their posts. 
But I think under the circumstances, I would have done the same. As it looks to me, Gorgoth took advantage of an accidental situation, or his gang engineered the whole thing. I don't see how that could be. The hospital heating and refrigeration systems are automatic and virtually foolproof. After I talk to those guards, suppose we make a complete check. Happy, call those men in here. A few moments later, Commander Corey dismisses the guards and, with Dr. Arnold and Happy, examines the master temperature control unit in the sub-cellar of the Terra Hospital. This graph on the control unit tells a story, Commander. Mm. Up to 1,400 hours, everything was normal, almost a straight line. Yeah. Then the heating chart swoops up to 140 degrees. To freeze the water system and raise the room temperatures to the degree we experienced a while ago, well, the whole central regulating system would have to be out of adjustment. And as you see now, everything's normal. Yes. Uh, doctor, what's that device over there in the corner? Hmm? Oh, I, uh... Hmm. Frankly, I don't know. I never saw it before. Let's have a look at it. Judging by the handles on it, it was meant to be portable. It isn't very heavy, sir. Well, Dr. Arnold doesn't know what it is, and it doesn't resemble anything I'm familiar with. Me either, Commander. We just take it to the security lab for a check. In the rear view scope of a private space cruiser, the bright circle that is Terra grows smaller and smaller. Two men watch it intently, moment after moment, without speaking. Then, with a sigh of relief, the larger of the two men turns to his companion. Well, the screen's clear, Razzler. If anyone was after us, we'd have spotted them by now. Yeah, I guess we made it, Mr. Gaga. <laughs> I'd like to know what's going on back at that hospital. I'll bet Corey's tearing the place apart. Yeah, but what if he found a zero ray? Well, what if he has? Does that mean he can face it to you? Well, you... well does it? No. No, of course not. At least not right away. Now, wait a minute. Do you mean there's a slight chance that the zero ray can be faced to you? Now, look, Mr. Gargoth, didn't I take a big chance getting you out of the hospital? Would I be hiding you out in my place at Meteor Lake if I thought the space patrol would reach out and grab me? It's my policy to trust nobody. You may be sincere, Rensselaer, but you're not infallible. Your cabin at Meteor Lake will do for the time being. Yes, sir. When we reach Venus, I'll check with my agents for a safer hideout. Back in his office at Space Patrol Headquarters, Commander Corey examines a stack of diagrams and documents. From time to time, he pulls one aside and places it in a separate file. Buzz looks up as Happy enters. Here's the Space Control Operations Report, Commander. Okay, Happy. Incidentally, it didn't take long for the lab to find out what that gadget was for. The one we found at the hospital? Mm -hmm. It's a practical application of the Volkovsky Principle. Oh, it is? Well, well, uh... What's the Volkovsky principle, Commander? Well, as you know, heat is the result of rapid movement of molecules, either in a gas, liquid, or solid. Yes, sir. Some time ago, a scientist named Volkovsky advanced the theory that extremely low temperatures might be produced by an electromagnetic force that slowed down molecular vibration. And this thing we picked up at the hospital does that? Yes, Happy. It projects invisible beams that literally freeze everything they touch. Oh. And that's what froze the water system. Exactly. Yeah, but wait. The, the rooms were overheated. What caused that? The same device. One of the freeze beams was focused on the master thermostatic control. As you know, a thermostat doesn't think, it reacts. When it contracts from cold, it turns on the heat, trying to restore a normal adjustment and equilibrium. Oh, and this gadget fooled it. Yes, when the central thermostat registered cold, the system kept pouring out heat. Wow. Fortunately, the device producing the freeze beam shut itself off before any real damage occurred. Except that Gargoth escaped. Yes. But Major Robertson found out something very interesting, Happy. He made a check through our records of everyone submitting designs pertaining to the Valkovsky principle. He found this. Hmm. <laughs> it's too complicated for me, sir. It's a preliminary application for a patent presented five years ago by three electronics engineers here on Terra. The government board of analysts pointed out some defects and everybody lost interest. Well, there weren't any defects in that model we found at the hospital. Uh, those three inventors must have corrected their mistakes. No, Happy, they lost interest. The man who drew up their designs seems to have continued independently. The designs were drawn up by Ulrich Rensselaer. See, his name is on this drawing. Mm-hmm. Robbie's positive that the physical work done on the freeze beam device is that of Ulrich Rensselaer. It matches that of the models of other types of inventions submitted for inspection. Oh, then Rensselaer is, is working with the Cobra Gang. Either that or the Cobra Gang stole the model from Rensselaer and planted it in the hospital. Rensselaer. Rensselaer. Hey, wait a minute. Uh, that operations report I just handed you. Uh, could I see it a moment, sir? Here it is, huh? I know I saw that name here somewhere. For the past year, Rensselaer has been living on Venus by Meteor Lake, supposedly on royalties from his inventions. Uh, here, sir, I found it. 
this ship that blasted off at 1432, private cruiser VP-738, it's registered to Ulrich Rensler. I'll alert Venus Space Patrol, then we'll blast off of Venus. Let's see if anything's going on at Mediate Lake. Several hours later, the Terra 5 roars high over the cloudy surface of Venus, spiraling around the Meteor Lake region, 300 miles west of Venus City. Carefully, Cadet Happy adjusts the infrared viewscope scanner. I can make out a construction of some kind, Commander. It seems to be on a slight rise of ground a few yards from the lake shore. That's Rensler's cabin. Uh-oh. And there's a spaceship. It's set down in a clearing just south of the cabin. It looks like the class and type of cruiser registered to Rensler. See if you can find a place where we can land without being seen or heard from the cabin. That's going to be tough, sir. Unless we want to hike through the hill several miles. Let me take a look at that screen. That is going to be a problem. The lake would act like a sounding board if it came in close. Yeah, and the valley would echo our rockets. Hey, wait. At the north end of the lake, there's an inlet. Sort of like a pointing finger. Yes, sir. That inlet is shielded from the cabin side of the lake by this curved ridge. A low gliding approach from the north might do the trick. You'd have to land on the other side of the inlet, but that ridge might dampen the sound. Yeah. Still means a hike nearly halfway around the lake. But stand a good chance of surprising Rensler and Gargan. Inside the comfortable cabin, Ulrich Rensler gazes out through the window, out across the lake. Smiling, he turns to his companion. Beautiful, isn't that, Mr. Garga? That's the third time you've said that. Look, show me where your space phone is. I want to make arrangements to get out of here. Just as you wish. But you're just as safe here as any place. I'm sure I heard a spaceship a while ago. Ah, it's nothing to worry about. Possibly one flew over the valley several miles north of the lake, and the sound rumbled down. No one could get close to the cabin without our seeing them. And believe me, we could hold off an army. Yes? How? The same device I used to throw the hospital temperature control system out of order. The zero ray. You mean that's a weapon? Yeah. It's got an effective range of a thousand yards. Turn it on any living thing for ten seconds, and it will freeze it solid. Look, I'll show you. What are you going to do? Just watch. I'll turn it on. Better stand over there out of the way. Now, that's it. Now, you see those leaves fluttering in the breeze? Keep your eye on them. They stop moving. That's right. The smaller the object, the quicker it works. The zero ray slows the dents of any electrons down almost to a stop. Wait. Look over there. Those bushes by the edge of the lake. Something moved. Yeah, it's probably a deer. There are a lot of them in this. That's no deer. It's a man. He's gone now, but I saw his space patrol uniform. Ah, don't worry, Mr. Gargard. This will take care of him nicely. But he's out of sight. That doesn't matter. A few sweeps of the zero ray across that clump of brush and every living thing there will be frozen solid. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. This is Dick Tufeld in Los Angeles reporting on the famous jet plane assigned to the vital Air Force mission of defending America's homeland, Lockheed's F-94C Starfire. In a moment, we'll hear from Tony LeVere, the well-known record-breaking test pilot on the Starfire. Within seconds after warning, this radar-controlled interceptor can be off the ground and streaking to 45,000 feet or higher. Packing 48 rockets, it can fly and fight in sunshine or darkness at speeds of more than 600 miles an hour. Now, Tony LeVere, tape recorded this morning at a California air base. You know, good health is important to a test pilot, and I have to stay in top condition. I get lots of rest and eat plenty of good food. That's why I like a good cereal for breakfast, like rice checks or wheat checks. They have real energy, and they taste swell. Why don't you try them? Make sure you keep yourself ready for action, the way Tony LeVere and lots of other famous test pilots do. Eat rice checks or wheat checks every morning. The cereals that are tops three ways. Tops for taste... For size, for real get-up-and-go. That's checks, wheat or rice. And remember, they're tops with America's top pilots. And now back to today's Space Patrol adventure, the Zero Ray. Emil Gargoth, leader of the Cobra Gang, escaped from the Terra Hospital with the aid of Ulrich Rensler. And now the two men are hiding in Rensler's cabin at Meteor Lake on the planet Venus. Hoping to take the two criminals by surprise, Buzz and Happy are cautiously making their way through the brush along the lake shore, unaware that they've been observed. 
From the cabin, Rensler is sweeping the deadly zero-ray beam over the vegetation, planning to freeze the two space patrollers literally in their tracks. Something that happened. I could do with the rest. This heat is really something. Yeah. Look at these leaves and branches. What about them, sir? A moment ago, they were swaying in the breeze. Now they're rigid. Yet the breeze is still blowing. Uh Uh-huh. It's rippling the water on the lake. Look out, Hap. Commander, if you hadn't warned me, that that limb would have hit me. Hap, look at these leaves and twigs. Smoking rockets. They shattered, just like glass. And feel the limb. Cold. Cold as ice. Yes. In the tropical weather of Venus. This is a perfectly healthy branch. Now, why would it break off in a little breeze? Because it's brittle. Hap, look over there to your right. See how those leaves suddenly stop fluttering? Yeah. It's as though something were passing over them and and freezing them. Hap, quickly. Under the bank and jump off into the water. Hurry. Wow. I'm glad we jumped instead of dived. The water isn't even up to our hips. Nessler and Gargoth have one of those freeze beam machines at the cabin. Then they've seen us. Probably. They aren't sure exactly where we are. Or they wouldn't be swinging the beam around like that. I hope that bank is high enough to shield us. It is. The beam is right over our heads now. How can you tell? That branch just above us suddenly stopped moving. Well, look, sir. The tree on the left is still moving. Yeah. They must have shut off the freeze beam. They figure they finished us, huh? We'll keep to the water and work around past the cabin. And maybe we can surprise them. See? There's not a sign of them. They're somewhere in that brush, rigid as statues. Let's go and find them. No. We're getting out of here right now. What for? Nobody will bother us now. Are you crazy? How do we know that a whole fleet of space patrol ships won't be landing here any minute? Yeah, maybe you're right. But I still don't think Mars is such a good place. You operated from there for a while. I operated from Lowell City. This place I've got in mind is a way off from everything. Yeah, yeah, you showed me on the map. All right, Mr. Gargon, I'll load the zero-ray equipment in the ship. So Leave it can... here. I don't want to take time to bother with it. Let's get out of here while we've got a chance. Wait a minute, Hap. Don't go any farther. I can see the roof of the cabin now. Got to be careful and not let Gargoth and Rensselaer see us. It's going to be rough, passing the front of the cabin. The bank isn't very high and there's no vegetation. Smoking rockets. There's a spaceship blasting off. Oh, they got away. Uh, I guess they knew that we dodged the freeze ray. Not necessarily. Gee, they're nearly out of sight already. And it'll take us at least an hour to get back to our ship. Let's go to the cabin instead. Take the space phone Venus City to alert patrol ships. Look for Rensselaer's cruiser. Yeah, I hope they haven't smashed their space phone transmitter. Well, come on, Hap. We'll keep undercover as much as possible. For all we know, somebody may still be at the cabin. Cautiously, Buzz and Happy work their way toward the cabin, then softly approach the door, which stands wide open. Maybe somebody's in there after all. The door's open. Well, I've got to come out in the open now. Come on. I'll go in first. It's deserted, all right. Yes, it has all the signs of a hasty departure. Yeah, they didn't even take time to pack. Look at all the stuff here. Yeah. Rensler must have thousands of credits worth of furnishings. Let's look around. Maybe we can get a clue on where they went. I'll check over the desk. Yes, sir. Say, here's the freeze beam equipment. Only Rensler calls it the Zero Ray. Zero Ray Model X1, it says here on the panel. Uh-huh. Several notebooks here. I'll take them along to study later. Commander, here's some numbers scribbled down. By the looks of them, they may be space phone frequencies. Let me see them. Uh-huh. And here's some maps, astrogation charts, and sectional maps of some of the planets. Let me see those maps. Are there any special marks on them? No, I'll check, sir. There's a notation on this scratch pad that might mean something. The word Jupiter has been crossed out, and there's a word that looks like it might be Mars. And it says 150NE-LC. Hmm. 150NE... L.C. It doesn't mean a thing to me. Oh, Commander, here's a chart of Sector H5, Mars, and it's got a mark on it. Let's see. Yeah, it's a tiny cross. That's all arid desert in that region. Cross between Lowell City and a nearly played-out mining area. Wait a minute. 
Let's see the scale. Happy, what if N-E-L-C stood for northeast of Lowell City? How far is that small X from Lowell City? Uh, about 150... Say, 150 N-E-L-C... Yeah, it fits 150 miles northeast of Lowell City. I'll space it for a Mars space patrol to check on that area from very high altitude so we won't scare anybody away. Then we'll blast off for Mars. Great. But I sure dread that long trek back around the edge of the lake to that ship. Why, if Rensler only had a boat, we could row across and save a lot of time. It's all right, Hap. We'll uh, walk across. Okay, that's an idea. We can wa- uh, walk across the lake? Sure. We can work this zero, Ray. Stand back, Hap. Uh, yes, sir. I'm going to focus it right at the edge of the lake and turn up the power. Smoke and rockets. The water's turning to ice. A whole strip of it. Uh-huh. A strip as wide as the freeze beam. After I make that space phone call, we'll carry the zero ray machine down to the lake and make our bridge of ice ahead of us as we cross. In the small sleeping compartment of his private cruiser, Ulrich Rensler tosses fitfully on his bunk as the ship streaks through space toward the planet Mars. Suddenly, he awakens with a start as a hand grips his shoulder. <laughs> come on, come on, Rensler, wake up. Oh, it's you, Mr. Clark. Who did you expect it to be? Uh, nobody I'm... aboard but us. Just jumpy, I guess. Do you want me to take the controls for a while? Yes. That isn't why I called you. Your quick freeze ray didn't work back at the lake. What? How do you know? I overheard part of a space phone conversation. You know who that was trying to surprise us at the cap? Commander Corey. Corey? You not only missed him, but he's wise to our plan. He knows we're going to the desert outside of Lowell City. Oh. How could he possibly know about that? Oh, I don't get excited. I've got a plan worked out so we can finish Corey for good. Wait, Mr. Garga. Uh, let's leave Corey alone. It's foolproof, Rensler. Corey's going to search the desert in a surface car. He figures he can pass for somebody connected with one of those mining outfits in that area. Yeah. We'll switch to an atmosphere ship at Hubble Settlement on the other side of Mars. Then we'll take care of Corey. With Lowell City far behind them, Buzz and Appy roar over the Martian desert highway in a sand-scarred surface car. From their rough work clothes, they appear to be a couple of mining engineers on their way to one of the lonely quarries or mines on the Martian wastelands. Gee, Commander, we've come more than 50 miles and we haven't seen a soul. That's probably why Gargoth picked this region for a hideout. With this battered-up car and the surveying equipment, we ought to be able to get pretty close to his place without exciting suspicion. That's what I'm counting on, Hap. With all those tools back there, we could be independent prospectors if we have to. Hey, Commander, look. I see it, Hap. It's an atmosphere ship and it's swooping down right on top of us. That ship's on, they're close enough to blast us to pieces. Hey, what's that? It's a ship's magnetic holding field. Smoke and rockets. Hey, they're picking up the car. They're right off the highway. We're helpless. If they cut that field, we'll crash. Well, the ship's sure gaining altitude fast. Yes, it's too late to jump. <laughs> Are you all right, Commander? It's Gargoth. Listen to me, Commander. Switch your space phone to 478.2 megacycles. And don't attempt to contact Space Patrol headquarters or I'll cut the holding field and drop you. Understand? Yes, Gargoth. I understand. We are now 100 feet off the ground. Rensler will maintain this altitude until we are far away from Lowell City. We're over the hills. I shall cut the holding field and drop you into a most inaccessible spot, miles from a highway or road. Chances are the wreckage will never be found. Just how do you think you're going to get off of Mars? Every spaceport is being watched, and this is only an atmosphere ship. I have a spaceship ready, and it's miles from a spaceport, Commander. Now, if you'll excuse me, Corey, I'll keep a sharp lookout for space patrol ships. Fix. Not a patrol ship in sight. No. I'm sure that space phone switch is at the off position, Hap. I don't want Gargoth to hear us. Believe me, there are a few things I want him to hear. Got to work fast, Happy. What can we do? We're suspended under the belly of a ship a hundred feet off the ground, and Gargoth will probably take us higher before he drops us. Hap, reach back in that tool chest. Yes, sir. Is an Atomo torch there? Well, yes, sir. Good. Now listen, right above us in Gargoth's ship is a small cargo bay. Now get busy with that cutting... There's no other ship in sight, Mr. Garga. Good, and we're at 250 feet altitude. Uh, then ought to make it nice and permanent. All right, Rensler. Cut the holding field. There they go. <laughs> I'll bank the ship so we can watch that surface car crash. Boom! Uh, some smash, eh, Mr. Garga? Uh, that takes care of Corey and his cadet. It's your death. There's no doubt about it this time. We really... 
Mr. Gardner. Rensler, what's the matter with you? Have you... Corey, don't stand there gibbering, Rensler. Shoot them. No, you don't. It's... <laughs> Hey, come out of the controls. Gargle's trying to crash us. We're driving straight for a hill. Oh, Rensselaer, have Okay, Gargoth, I'll take over. Oh, you pulled her out just in time. I'll take the ship into Lowell City, Hap. This time, we'll make sure Gargoth doesn't pull any tricks and escape. No, sir. He won't get a chance to dodge the brainograph test by going to the hospital, either. Yeah, Gargoth, you're going to the brainograph with a clear head if, if I have to knock you cold. An action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. Space Patrol, as you all know what sound effects are, you hear them all the time on your radios. But listen to these musical sound effects and see if you can guess what we're doing with Rice Checks and Wheat Checks. Yep, Space Patrollers, there's a big bowl filling up with Rice Checks or Wheat Checks. Man, oh man, it even sounds delicious. And it tastes even better. Those triple oven toasted biscuits are tops for taste. Now we're pouring on the cream. Listen, you can almost hear those crisp, crunchy checks filling up with that cream. And then for the first bite, wow, what a bite. Size just right. Because checks are made in that modern bite size design, make some tops for size. Hey, that's you, blasting off for a big day of action after a good nourishing breakfast with checks. The cereal's tops for get up and go. So, gang, go get rice checks today and get wheat checks, too. The official bite sized cereals of the Space Patrol. In the red and white checkerboard package with the picture of Commander Corey or Cadet Happy on the outside, the one and only cereals that bring you a free Space Patrol trading card inside the package. Rice checks, wheat checks. <laughs> Now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Appy are in their spacesuits, advancing across the rocky surface of the planet Mercury toward the hideout of an escaped criminal. Hold it, Happy. Something moved up there ahead of us. It looked like an animal of some kind. An animal on Mercury? Yeah, that's right. Well, whatever it is, uh, there's another one. Pat, it's a small robot. Castro is probably using them to observe us. Yeah, they look like turtles, except that they move a lot faster. You go back a few hundred yards and figure out another plan of action. Pat, look behind us. We're surrounded by them. Yes, sir. Oh, my leg. It's some kind of weapon. They're shooting pain rays right through our space suits. They're closing in on us. Dozens of them. Commander, I can't move. Be sure to join us next week for the thrilling story, The Super Brain of Bulmer Castro, when Rice Checks and Wheat Checks again present... Space Patrol! Space Patrol, created by Mike Moser, starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey, and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston, produced and directed by Larry Robertson, executive producer Mike Devery. Other players were Ken Mayer, Norman Jolly, Baylor Kovach, and Stephen Robertson. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Rice Checks and Wheat Checks again present Space Patrol! Be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol program on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. This program is broadcast to our armed forces overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Space Patrol came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network.